So my name's Stefan Hykovic, good pronunciation of the surname. And I come from a very different field of science and I'm in awe and wonder at how incredible the stuff we've just seen is. Um, I come from the dismal science of economics uh, and I want to present a case to you today about the innovation imperative that exists for Australia. Uh, in that I think we're in unique economic times at the moment which creates some challenges and opportunities in front of us. So I want to build an argument about why we need to innovate and then try in the very last slide to answer this question, what will we be selling in 2050? First thing I think that's happening in the global economy that matters a lot for us is commodity price volatility. Why does this matter? Um, in economic theory, it's pretty well established that a diversified economy is more resilient than one that just sells a couple of things. So if you're selling only one thing, you're completely dependent on the price of that one thing and the market for that one thing. If it crashes, your economy crashes and burns. Now, Australia's exports, we get 40% of all that we export from iron ore, coal and gold, just three uh, commodity exports. Uh, we can throw a few more things in there that take it up to, to over 70%, but those three things matter hugely for our economy. So price movements in these three commodities will matter a lot for the survival of Australia into the future. But commodity prices are sending us some concerning signals as we look out into the future. One of the main ones is volatility. Volatility relates to the um, up and down movement on the commodity price graph over a period of time. Now, we've gone through the 1990s to 2000s of fairly, fairly flat commodity price, uh, prices, but as we came into the year 2000, commodity prices started to grow, and over the last decade, we've had unprecedented growth in commodity prices that hasn't happened for the past 40 years. So the Australian economy has enjoyed this, this growth in commodity prices, uh, and that's why we came through the finance crisis so smoothly, and, and our economy is looking so good. Uh, compared to a lot of other ones around the world, is because we had this strong commodity price growth. Well, that's one of the main reasons. Our banking sector was pretty well positioned compared to a lot of the rest of the world. But in addition to price growth, what we are also seeing that matters a lot is volatility. And that's the amount of upward and downward movement, the instability of prices. All the indices are showing us that if we look at the first half of the last decade and the second half of the last decade, that volatility has increased. This is the United Nations um, Commission on Trade and Development data set, which measures price instability for a major commodity types. So for all commodities, food, mineral oils and metals, and crude petroleum, we can see the instability index uh, for the first five years of the past decade was lower than where it is now. So we've got into more turbulent conditions. Now I think an analogy here is, imagine when you're flying in a plane and you hit a bit of turbulence, the pilot doesn't really know what's ahead, they tell you to buckle up because it could get bumpy. Well, it's similar in the market conditions. We hit, we've hit turbulence, it's got bumpy. Um, we don't have the forecasting abilities to look ahead because we don't really know what's going to happen, but we're worried we're in for some major dips and dives which create risk and uncertainty. So the best we can do is, is buckle up. It matters for us because our economy is so heavily dependent on uh, commodity exports. If we look at a longer term picture, the concerns are perhaps even heightened. Uh, this looks at commodity price movements over the past 100 years. It's an index of 33 different commodity types. And we can see the, the changes in commodity prices as we've had some world wars and inflationary oil shocks. But overall that century we've seen an annual decline of 1.2% until about the year 2000, where it seems to have bounded and is rising rapidly. And any good investor knows it's on the top of the hill that you get most worried, not down at the bottom of the hill, because we don't know whether the corrections are coming. So, it's painting an interesting question for what's going to happen ahead uh, with the, um, the mining boom and how long the commodities boom is going to continue for the Australian economy. Another concerning indicator that we can have a look at is multi-factor productivity. Multi-factor productivity measures the ratio of outputs to inputs. It's basically how much uh, we have to put into the factory and how much out we get at the other end. How efficiently are we using the resource inputs? Well, the average market sector growth in Australia and multi-factor productivity has been strong until recently it's come down. But in the mining sector, multi-factor productivity has come down even more sharply. It's very controversial about why and how this might be happening. Uh, the Productivity Commission report that presents this data argues that it's associated with a decline in the natural resource base in that the ore grades are lower and that we have to put more resource inputs in to get the commodity exports out. So, did it wrong button. So what's happening to ore grades? This is kind of helps answer the question for me because if we look at these two graphs, the top one there is the production of ore from Australia 
and the bottom graph is the ore grade, the amount of useful commodity that we can extract from that ore body. Now the production is going up very steeply, but the ore grade, the quality of the ore body, is on a gradual and permanent decline. And this is why we're having to put more effort in to extract the fewer resources that exist in those ore bodies. And that might be what's, trying, what's explaining the declining multi-factor productivity for mining and the Australian economy overall. So I think this, this is pointing towards one of the first reasons to innovate in the Australian economy. What is interesting to me is if we do look into the mining sector, uh, is a question of whether we'll be selling rocks in the future or maybe know-how. This graph here shows you the mining technology services and equipment industry, uh, MTSE. It um, globally has grown quite substantially, but in Australia is growing at a lesser rate, but still is growing. This is really the export of knowledge and know-how. Uh, the data sets that are being held by ABAR are incomplete on this one, but we're seeing a growth in the the services, equipment, technology that surrounds mining. So mining of the future may be more about selling the know-how than just the rocks and the products. If we look into the sales revenue, it's climbing into the billions of dollars for Australia there. Whoops. Another aspect that challenges the situation of mining is the rate of um, urbanisation in China and how long it can continue for. Uh, over the last few decades and for the next few decades, the rate of urbanisation looks like it's going to be very rapid. China builds three cities the size of Sydney every year and will do so out to 2030 uh, to accommodate its rural to urban migration. And the city of Shenzhen was built at the rate of a skyscraper a day on a boulevard a week during the 1990s and sprung up really quickly. And to build these cities, they're using Australian commodities. They're using our resources and this is why prices are high. But if we look at the urban annual growth rate in China, how much more people become urbanised every year, every year that growth rate is declining. So. Currently it's around 2%, it's going to gradually fall down to around 0.8% and less and less. And as the rate of construction of cities in China levels out, um, the demand for commodities may level out too. Now it could be picked up from, from India or elsewhere, but there are signals that the Chinese econ economy will eventually uh, plateau and the demand for Australian commodity resources will plateau as well. Uh, I think also interestingly in China, uh, the growing pains associated with rapid urbanisation. Uh, in August 20, 26th of August 2010, there was a traffic jam that lasted for 14 days uh, on one of the arterials into Beijing. And this is because the place is growing so quickly, uh, we're seeing these sorts of overshoots. So if you reckon the traffic in Brisbane is bad, try living there. And uh, other, other offshoots that have been interesting are the construction of ghost towns. Ordos in China is one example of such a town and built for a million people with nice houses, but the people never arrived. So the rapid rate of urbanisation there is showing some um, concerning signals, which has implications for Australia commodity exports. So that takes us a first look at uh, why there might be some innovation imperatives around the commodity exports of digging up rocks and selling them. It's a great business to be in while the commodity prices are high, but what may happen into the future with volatility and the, the changing demand for our resources in China is of concern. The other thing is uh, we're moving into a new world economy. Uh, this is projections by the Asian Development Bank and it shows the composition of the world economy uh, in 2000, well, back to 1980 through to now. Um, the European Union and the United States are quite large, but they will shrink as we move out to 2030. China gets a lot bigger, India gets a bit bigger, uh, and the newly industrialised economies also grow in their share of world GDP. The other th concerning things we're seeing at the moment is, you know, all in the headlines is the European sovereign debt crisis where debt levels are, are going extremely high. And the two graphs here show the budget uh, surplus or deficit positions as a percentage of GDP of the European countries, with Ireland taking a crash and burn there. And the other uh, graph is long-term interest rates indicative of the cost of acquiring debt, which is extremely high in Greece. Um, public debt to GDP ratio across the Western world and the OECD countries is also looking bad compared to uh, the newly industrialised Asian economies. And the big concern we all got is looking at Italy. It's the eighth largest economy in the world, 2.3 trillion. We really hope it doesn't fall over. It can impact Australia through China and the banking system, but at least in, through the banking system, we have minimal exposure. Uh, Australian blank, blank claims on Europe as a percent of total bank assets are in the vicinity of, of 2% across the Euro area. And for the most contaminated stuff is down to sort of 0.4 and 0.2%.
So most of it is that the Australian economy is not hugely dependent on uh, Europe and may not be so badly hit by the debt crisis or if uh, the Italian economy does topple. Our economy has shifted towards Asia, which is a good thing, because if we look at this map here, this is a, an economic geographer who's published a paper uh, explaining where the centre of gravity of the world's economy is. He basically takes 700 points across the world, looks at the GDP at each of those locations, and has some equations to see where they centre, what's the centre of gravity for all the economic activity in the world. And in 1980, it was a black dot in the Atlantic um, Ocean, uh, being influenced by the United States and Europe. But every year he's made this calculation, it's taken a shift to the east. There's not much up and down movement, so the equator doesn't seem to be changing the balance. But certainly the um, rapid industrialization of India, China and Asian economies is dragging that centre of gravity across to, towards China by 2050. So now it's somewhere over Saudi Arabia, uh, but by 2050 it will be uh, over China uh, at current projections. So that's changing the, the relationships we have, but Australia's relationship is being more heavily built towards India and China. China's kind of well known. They're our biggest trading partner and our trade with them grows around 10% every year. India's not yet that well established um, in a lot of people's minds as, as important to Australia. And I think where a lot of the action lies is with India. If we look at the exports and imports from Australia to India, um, our imports are, are roughly stable, but our exports to India are growing very rapidly, uh, and Indians are getting wealthy. They are 5% middle class and will be 40% by 2025 on current estimates. So that creates a possibility of a big demand for Australian exports into India. And it also increases the possibility that Indians will be coming here for holidays. The um, data on short-term arrivals of Indian people into Australia uh, show us a graph like this since 1990 to now in that short-term arrivals stay in Australia for less than a year, so a lot of these people are tourists or coming here for business reasons um, with, with money to spend and it's clearly changing the makeup of tourism in Australia. So I think there is another innovation imp imperative before Australia is the um, changing world economy and the rise of the Indian and Chinese economy is well established, but the rise of the Indian economy. Do we really necessarily understand India and what and how to do business with them and how um, what the tourists from India might want? Next big innovation challenge relates to food. Um, projections from calculated from CSIRO show that we're going to make more food in the next 50 years than in the previous 500 if we're able to feed ourselves because of more people eating more food. We've recently crossed the 7 billion threshold for world population, but increasing rates of per capita calorie consumption and across Asia we're seeing a shift away from cereals into proteins, meat, eggs, milk, fish, which require higher energy to produce. So the world has an enormous food produ production challenge in front of it. Today there are one billion people who uh, don't have enough to eat uh, and one billion people who have too much to eat. The opportunities for agriculture are significant and I wonder about whether it's right to use the words a possible resurgence of Australian agriculture. So we've seen agriculture's share of GDP decline from some 20% to 3% over the past century. Perhaps we're about to see a point of inflection in that graph and agriculture is about to get a lot more important. One of the reasons is the price growth in agriculture. Um, I'm part of a team around the world who's been looking at price movements in commodity uh, food commodity prices and we've been trying to explain why in 2008 we saw a price spike and why again in 2010 we've seen an unprecedented high price spike. Now these price spikes really do matter for uh, a lot of people in developing countries because they spend 80% plus of household income on food and when prices spike they can't stop buying movie tickets and buy more food um, because they're spending all their money on food already and that leads to, it transmits through to starvation and hunger quite quickly. So the current spike is of much concern and we're trying to understand why. Is this a result of speculation on agricultural commodities futures? Is it the result of biofuels or trade barriers, import restrictions? What's going on to cause the market to behave this way? So it's concerning signals, but there's also massive opportunity in here for Australian agriculture to respond to these high price signals and, and help solve the problem of, of hunger in the world um, by, uh, by increasing production. I think this graph here, 
shows us how quickly Australian wheat farmers have been able to respond to high prices over time. A couple of those dips are associated with drought. The red line shows us the area of production and the blue line shows us the production in tonnes. And it does show a case of an industry able to innovate and respond quite quickly to changes in price uh, based on what world markets are doing. So it doesn't, it's not a stable line. Uh, and that's where some innovation may occur. We also see an increasing linkage as, as agriculture becomes industrialised and the use of more equipment occurs, the oil price really explains movements in the food price very closely. Um, in the 90s, not so much, but as we've moved into recent times, modern agriculture pretty much converts oil into food. So um, energy scarcity is highly relevant to what happens in food. So the world faces massive food security challenges, which represent a humanitarian crisis, but also instability. Political instability is closely linked with food insecurity. Um, and one of the graphs, I saw a map at a recent conference of all the food uh, riots that are happening around the world, which are leading to political instability uh, and are, are much concern. Concern. There is an opportunity for Australia to look at this situation of food price movements to determine how it can get into the markets and help fix it. The next um, innovation imperative that I'd put up in front of Australia is what I'd call a big backyard, but our resources are still scarce. The first um, environment program that we introduced in Australia of any size was the National Land Care Program. Uh, prior to that, the, um, one of the papers written on it says that the annual expenditure on Australia's natural resources was less than what they spent on the upkeep of the federal parliament gardens. And that was introduced at $360 million in 1990. We have grown those programs at the sale of Telstra in 1996 uh, with NHT1, the Natural Heritage Trust, at $1.3 billion. We then got the Natural Heritage Trust Phase 2 and National Action Plan on Salinity and Water Quality at 1.2 and 1.4 billion, and Caring for Our Country at 2.25 billion. We've increased the amount of public sector funds that are going into repairing our degraded environment, but we still remain hugely challenged in seeing a return on those investments. And this came out for me at a recent project I worked on with the Australian Government was the Reef Rescue Package up in North Queensland. And uh, I think we saw an environmental triage dilemma there with a limited amount of resources and a lot of things to spend it on. It was a $200 million package and I did some back of the envelope calculations flying out of Townsville for one of these meetings. And $200 million across the reef uh, catchments comes to $1.5 per hectare per year. Now, a hectare is a football field and $1.5 does not change the land use on a hectare. So when you look at it, you've got a huge, um, targeting question of which part of the reef do we do we protect. I think the analogy is like going down to Coles to do the shopping for a family of five with ten dollars. You're not going to come out with everything you need. The only real solution to saving the reef, given that the um, projected decline is 60 per cent by 2030, the only real solution is via innovation. We have to come up with some radically new solutions to look at issues of sea, sea level temperature, sorry, sea temperature rise associated with mass coral bleaching, but also sediment, nutrient and pollution emission from the landscapes onto the reef. I think the same goes for Australia's Murray-Darling Basin, where in its natural state that flowed 100% of time at Manum at the river mouth, but now only flows 40% of the time because of the amount of water resources that are taken off. We do not have enough water resources to keep the Murray-Darling Basin running ecologically intact, and the nation faces some critically difficult triage dilemmas about which uh, ecosystems are kept alive with sufficient waters and which are not, because it's a, a regulated system and the water can be controlled about where it flows. So again, in resource constraints like that, innovation is the only real solution. And I think the management of Wyvernhoe Dam is an interesting issue of um, whilst we have a big place, we still face resource scarcity. We have some horribly difficult decisions to make currently about how much is released versus how much is held for water storage. And it's not a tricky one. I'm, part of my background is in decision theory and I find it fascinating to think about how you would make these decisions wisely. Um, I remember four years ago when the dam levels were at 19% combined across the southeast Queensland region and falling at 1% per month and we were on tight water restrictions and we bought a water tank and we were look, heading, heading towards drought and it was not a case of too much water. Well, in January this year, we experienced the opposite with floods um, as Wyvernhoe became too full and they had to release the waters and, and the, the effects were obvious. So again, we're making these difficult trade-offs um, here about how much water we hold on for drinking and have water storage versus flood mitigation. And again, uh, it's going to require innovation to solve these difficult decisions.
Next big um, innovation imperative is related to superannuation, which might sound a little bit more boring, but this one is actually uh, a massive challenge in front of the country. We're 13% over 65 currently, it's 27% by 2051, and our lifespans are getting longer. Now, um, if you take all the people working currently and push them out to retirement, and you look at how much money we've put away and how much we need to put away to live well, we have a gap of some $695 billion. That's around seven months of our GDP. And 2004, that gap was only $452 billion. So the gap in our required superannuation is getting larger, partly because of our ageing population, living longer, but also just not putting enough money away for the future. Now, that represents a massive challenge in front of Australia. Retirement ages are likely to be later in life. Um, and we're likely to see different models of retirement. You know, one of the um, areas that's uh, attracting a lot of attention is tapered retirement models. So that you don't sort of just stop working and get a lump sum payout, your working life gradually winds away and to, to nothing, so um, to die. But you don't actually, uh, maybe a bit before then, but it's gonna be pretty close into the future for a lot of us. So as we... Um, the, the tapered retirement models, things like the Minnesota theory of work adjustment, retirement transition and adjustment framework, are having a look at how a human being gets into different stages of their working life and the night nature of the roles they do and the hours they work gradually tapers off into retirement. And we may see that sort of thing happening more into the future. But the gap of, of a $700 billion shortfall in um, our superannuation savings is again something which requires some amazing innovation to think through a solution for. Just one little piece that I think is interesting uh, is that as we are getting older, it's good to see Australians still staying very active and this might be where part of the solution lies. Uh, the Masters Games are like the Olympic Games for old people and they started in 1985 in Toronto and fairly low Denmark, but I find it interesting to look at this data set because um, every time it happens in Australia, it bounces up to a much higher participation rate. Um, Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney and that those three are also heading in, a, in the right direction. So there may be some good signals that old people stay active as they, they get into their lives. The last uh, one I want to bring up is around the emergence of a digital economy. I think it is interesting how massively uh, social media have changed the way people interact and access information. If we make Facebook, Skype and Twitter countries, we have a population list for the world that's China 1.3 billion, India 1.2 and then we see Facebook at 800, Skype at 521 and Twitter at 8, 380 and I think it is fascinating and highly significant that the owners of Facebook can put up a message that becomes potentially visible to 800 million persons in the world. Um, and uh, governments rarely have that sort of connection to people. It's really starting to change the model. So there's a lot behind those statistics. I'm not sure how much is behind the popular tweet statistics. I tried to look at how Syro ranked against Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Britney Spears. We're down at 66, whereas the others are, that's not million, that's just 66. <laughs> well, that's a little bit higher. I'm not sure what we're doing wrong. Um, the diffusion of communications technology is happening rapidly. This graph shows us the top two lines there, the fixed phone and how long it took to get adoption, the television, which happened quite quickly, VCR, cable, home PCs. The one that's moving quite quickly currently is the high-speed internet. The high-speed internet growth here is happening quite sharply. Uh, and we're getting online pretty quickly. And in Australia, we're building a national broadband network, which is going to massively increase data transmission rates. And it's going to have implications for business models. Advertising is an interesting statistic to look at over time. In 2010, internet advertising accounted for 14% of global advertising expenditure, and it is expected to reach 18% by 2013. But the rate of growth there is pretty strong. A lot of um, traditional newspapers are very much struggling to survive in a world where the majority of us are getting our news mostly from the internet because everything we want to know about is there on demand on the internet and easily readily available, and that's the transition we're starting to see. We're also seeing a growth of e-commerce, which is particularly difficult for the retail sector in Australia, one of the sectors which has not sort of jumped back so quickly from the finance crisis is retail, um, partly because of the, the exchange rates and partly because of the growth of online sales that's projected to increase out into the future. Uh, 143 billion of internet orders received by Australian businesses in 2009-10, 15% up from the previous year. 
Uh, shoe shops are becoming places where people go to try on shoes and then they jump online and buy them from the United States with a great exchange rate. So that is a challenging uh, issue in front of the retail sector, but also something that starts to reshape business models and how our economy functions. Uh, it's linked to an increased services sector of the economy too. Uh, as we see the rise of information technology, a lot of people are moving out of primary production and resource intensive jobs into the service sector banking, finance, research, most of us here today. So that is a set of major innovation imperatives before Australia, hard to fix problems, opportunities associated with them as well, with no clear solution other than getting really smart about how we do things. So last night I was then trying to answer the rest of the presentation which I've left to one side. What will we be selling in 2050? I'm not really sure. It was about the best I could do but I think it's got something to do with ideas. I think it's got something to do with what we saw presented before me, okay? Radical, inc in incredible, intelligent ideas that can substantially shift where things are. Um, other countries, other parts of the world will come online and compete with us against resources. Commodity prices may take some dips and dives and be unstable. It may be that we move towards the main product is ideas and services that Australians can sell. What those ideas are, I think that's up to us to figure out. So thanks very much for your time.